Let's talk about a couple of these. So let me first off say this just it just has randomly worked out this way for both my ATS and my ATS this class. It's a good news, bad news day. So you have no homework tonight. Oh my god. Literally, thank you. I love my life. Just randomly worked out. Yeah, they're gonna put the test on the same day, right? Do we have a date no, for our I, test I yet? I'm oh, gonna try not to. How about that? Okay. We'll be one day apart. So okay. <laughs> that, that's that possibility. That's don't discount that. Yeah, we just okay. So let's talk about problem ten. Okay. So this is kind of old school net forces kind of thing. Okay. So. Small metal sphere, boom, here you go. So here's number 10. And it has a mass of 0 0.15 kilograms, which isn't very much. 0 0.15 grams, actually. And it's been charged to negative 23.0 nanocoulombs. It is, directly, it is directly above an identical sphere down here that has the exact same charge of negative 23.0 nanocoulombs, okay? And then the lower sphere is fixed, otherwise known as resting on the ground. So imagine this in terms of like balloons, all right? So imagine that I've got a negatively charged balloon here, and 10 centimeters above that, I have another negatively charged balloon. So don't worry about gravity, okay? Don't worry about gravity. So, don't worry about gravity. We'll deal with gravity later. Oh, yes. So, because they have the same charge, what's going to happen? They're going to repel each other. So, if you, if there was no gravity, you could calculate the force that's going to try to push these apart. And you can go F equals K 9.0 times 10 to the 9th Newtons meters squared per coulombs. Now, you have nanocoulombs. So what are you going to have to do with the nanocoulombs? Times 10 to the negative, negative 9. nine. But like, with the number. 23 <laughs> times 10 to the negative 9, but they're identical, so basically what are you going to do? You're going to square that, okay? And then, you know, they're separated by a distance of 10 centimeters, which is going to be 0 0.10 meters. And don't forget to square that. So that force is going to try and drive these apart. Okay? So if that was the only force in town, if that was it, if there was nothing else, if they were like sitting horizontally, okay, or if they were in a zero gravity field, that would be the only force to act upon them. To find the acceleration, multiply it or divide that by the mass, then there's your acceleration. But that's not what's happening. So you do have an electrostatic force that's trying to drive them apart. But is gravity acting on the top sphere? Yes. 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 Okay. Now, technically, 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 there is a gravitational force just between those two. Okay. There is. And you can calculate that using F equals big G M1 M2 over D squared. But that's going to basically be zero, okay? It's effectively going to be zero. Yes, they are gravitationally attracted to each other, just like Keaton is gravitationally attracted to the fire extinguisher, but I'm not going to worry about the fire extinguisher starting to drift toward Keaton, okay? Which would be cool, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of things I worry about. That is not on the list of things. But is that 0.15 gram mass attracted to this strange rock that we're on? Yes. 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 And that's gonna, that gravitational force is going to act which way? Down. Downward. Down. So at this point, you have two opposing forces. You have the electrostatic force, which is trying to drive it apart. You have the gravitational force, which is trying to pull it down. And you're going to use just your old school... Fg equals mg. You know the mass, make sure you convert that into kilograms. You know what g is. It's been a while since we talked about g, but there you go. 
And then you can figure the gravitational force acting downward and the electrostatic force acting upward. And the difference between those two is your net force. And then you divide that by the mass, boom, there's your acceleration. So anyway, so on 10A, uh, the magnitude of the force between the spheres, that should be something times 10 to the fourth. And then uh, you're going to find the, your net force, which, and then you're going to use that to find your acceleration. So your acceleration should be something times, uh, so something between 5 and 10 meters per second squared. Cool with that. Well, so <laughs> oh, it's just however you want to define it. <laughs> It's a negative what? force. You started saying times 10. No, 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 no. I was, I was looking at the first answer. Huh? Okay. The first answer is 10 to the negative 4. Okay. Now, on 12, and I realized the struggle was real on 12. 12? That is, the struggle is real. I told you that struggle was real. How many times did it take you? Five? Okay, I, I over-exaggerated on that one. I really don't think... Actually, I only tried once, and then I was like... <laughs> you told me five. No, I said that you to... Did. I told that to Zach and Evan. Well, that's To make it seem worse. You, you talked to Zach. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no. I mean, it did take me like a few times. Okay, probably a good three or four. Maybe five. Just... Okay, quit touching the chair. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God, Brett. <laughs> okay. So on number 12, here's your story. You know these two charges are sum up to 25 the air coulombs. So start with this. This is what I this is how I work it. Take Q1, Q2 over distance squared. So they gave you the force, you know that number. You know how far apart they are, and you know the value of K. So what's going to happen, what I did, I took force times d squared, and I divided that by k, and I just got one number off by itself, okay? Then I said, okay, that's going to equal charge on A times the charge on B. And then I said, okay, well, I'm going to let QA, and then I'm going to have 25 nanocoulombs minus QA, and that's going to be the other one. Okay? So this whole thing works out to just be one number. Okay? And then you distribute this, and that's where you get your squared, squareds from. Okay? So you're going to have like 25 nanocoulombs. Change that into coulombs if you're going to leave, leave this in coulombs. And then you're going to put, because remember, use the quadratic. What does one side have to equal? Zero. Now, on the next generation of calculators, they used to, and I don't know if it still does, I'm guessing, have a program where you can plug in just the values of A, B, and C, and it does it for you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I heard about that. Wait, but I don't know how to do that. Well, that was all the rage like maybe oh, three or four years ago, and the kids have figured out where you don't have to like do the negative B plus or minus. Did you ever make us do this on a test with these numbers? No. Okay, good. Now, what I what, what I might do on the test. I think you should put in coulombs at least for us. You know. Okay, <laughs> you're worried about using the quadratic formula. I just hate as that opposed to just multiplying by ten to the negative nine. Yeah, it just ruins everything. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like it makes it so confusing. You know what okay. I mean? Anyway, <laughs> b squared plus or minus b squared minus four and all over two a. No. So, because I know for a while, and I maybe I knew it was on the CI calculators where you could just plug in the values of A, B, and C, and it would automatically do all of this for you. What? Show me this way. Show me the way. I don't know. I never knew the way. So the kids always said that that, that was like a program that you could do. <laughs> so that's exactly what I was thinking of. What? <laughs> do you know? Huh? It's a meme or something. Okay. You know the little guy? Just never mind. <laughs> so on the test, no, I won't make oh, yeah, you go through the whole thing. But what I might <laughs> what expect I you to be able to do is like set it up. Okay, or at least say, hey, how would you begin to solve this problem? 
All right. Now, oh, yeah. the kilograms. let's talk about number 14 in terms of a bigger so idea. No. Okay? Let me write Oops. So number 14, here's your setup. Here's a charge of one nano coulomb. And then here's B, negative one nano coulomb. And C is over here at positive four nano coulombs. Okay? So this is a situation where you can work this a couple of ways. One is you can do smash mouth physics, okay? And you can do a whole bunch of calculations. Because here's A, here's B, here's C. And what's asking for on this one is that what's magnitude of direction of electric force acting on charge A? So this is a situation, just like, just step back for just a second and look at what's happening, okay? Don't, don't get wrapped up in the numbers because I know y'all are very good at number, plugging numbers into calculators. But just step back for a second. Go, okay, hmm. This is a positive charge. That's a negative charge. It's separated by a distance of one centimeter, right? Okay. So is A going to feel a repulsive or attractive force towards B? Attractive, because they're opposite the charge. So A is going to be pulled towards B. True? And I'm just I'm actually gonna I'm actually gonna leave this in nano coulombs and centimeters. Okay? I am. And you'll see why. So that's gonna be one nano coulomb and one nano coulomb divided by one centimeter squared. Okay? I can leave it to those units and just get a number. Because all I'm doing is comparing them anyway. Now if you're an absolute purist. That's one times 10 to the negative ninth, one times 10 to the negative ninth, 0 0.01 meters squared, and you could do all that, and you could actually find the value of the force. If you're an absolute mathematical purist, you could do that. You don't have to. But here's the point. That's going to be an attractive force going this way. Now, in terms of C, what is A going to feel relative to C? So C is going to try and push this thing back, right? Now, if there's going to be a net force, there's going to be a difference between that attraction and that repulsion, right? So this is the force between A and B. True? It's cool. Got that. Now, the force between A and C, well, that's going to be that same K value, a is still going to be 1 nano coulomb, but what's the charge on C? 4 nano coulombs. Now, what's the distance between A and C? 2 centimeters squared. 2 centimeters, but guess what? That's going to get squared. So when you square 2, this becomes 4. So then I have 4 up here and 4 down there, which reduces down to 1. So what's the net force on A? Zero. Zero. Wow. Okay. Because of the fact that in terms of magnitude, this force over here is four times greater. Excuse me, the charge is four times greater, but the distance is twice as far, but the distance gets squared, so that's how it balances out. So yes, you could go through and you could do smash mouth physics and you could do 1 times 10 to the negative 9 times 1 times negative 9 divided by 0 0.01 squared <laughs> times 9 times 10 to the 9th, and you could actually get that value. And you could do 4, and you could do the exact same thing. And they're still going to add up to 0. zero. Okay? Now, interesting thing happens. Let's talk about number 15. Same idea. Okay? So on 15... Here's Q1. There's negative 2 nanocoulombs. And here we have Q2. And that's going to be 10 centimeters. And that's going to be 10 centimeters. Okay? So, and on this one, Q2 experiences no electric force. What is the charge on Q1? So, Q2 over here. 
We're not saying it's not going to experience a force. We're just going to assume that it's not going to, it's not going to have any net force, okay? Just like gravity is pulling down on all of you right now, but the chair is pushing up on you, so you have no net force, okay? Same idea. So look at it in terms of this. So here's Q2. Now, let's just assume, for the sake of argument, that, and you're not told if Q2 is positive or negative, okay? So let, let's do the positive side first. We're positive kind of people. Let's assume that Q2 has a positive charge, okay? So if Q2 has a positive charge, what's it going to feel from that negative 2 nanocoulomb? It's going to feel an attraction this way, right? Yeah. Okay. And what's it going to feel from Q1? Repulsion. Repulsion. Okay, assuming that Q1 is positive, that's going to feel repulsive force. Now, think this through. It's the same idea. This force is negative 2 nanocoulombs. True? This is twice as far. So if it's twice as far, you square that, that becomes four. four. So if this is two nanocoulombs, the charge has to be four times greater, which would be eight. Okay? So you actually don't have to go through and do all the math. You could, okay? You could set the two forces equal to each other, okay? And you could go, oh, that's k, and that's k, and that's divided by d squared, and that's divided by d squared, and that's going to be 0.1 meters squared, and that's going to be 0 0.20 meters squared, and your k is going to cancel out, and that's going to be q1, q2, q1, q2, and you're still going to, you're still going to get to the same point, okay? You're still going to get to the same point. Now... Here's an interesting thing happens. What if Q had been a negative value? Would that change the answer? If this was negative, what would it feel? Repulsion. It would feel a repulsion from the negative charge. But what would it feel from that one? Uh, attraction. Guess what? Attraction. You still get the exact same answer. And still do the exact same answer. Still going to be a nanocoulomb. So, interesting thing to think through. Okay, so let's talk about number 16. So, charge to nanocoulombs at the origin, charge to 20, it's at a different coordinate. What is the magnitude and direction of electric force on each object? So, what you want to do on that one, and this is why I said you, you want to look at this in terms of the charges, so, but there's an interesting concept I want you to get out of 16. So you have a 10 nanocoulomb charge at the origin. And then over here, you're going to have a negative, 20, a negative at 0 and 2. Okay? And you're just going to use F equals K Q1 Q2 over D squared. Okay? Cool with this? Yeah. Cool. Now, you're going to get a number. And that number is going to be times 10 to the negative third. Okay? Now, here, one is 10 nanocoulombs. The other one is 20 nanocoulombs. Which one feels the greater force? The 10 nanocoulombs or the 20 nanocoulombs? Is it the 10? Is it the 20, or is it the same? Same. 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 Why? Because they both, both go into the same. Like gravity, <laughs> it's a force, and it's three. 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 Newton's third law. Third law, which says what? Equal ah. For every action, there is a reaction. Forces are coupled, <clears throat> right? Yes. So it's the same idea. Here's the Earth. Here's the moon. Earth pulls on the moon, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a cool thing. What does the moon do? The moon pulls back on the earth. Which one has the greater force? Mm -hmm. It's the exact same. Okay? It's the exact same. Which is why we have tides. Okay? 
because you have this pull from the moon that allows us to have tides. Okay, on 17, make sure and you've got to use that yellow sheet to look up the mass of the electrons and the protons. So on 17, make sure that you've told me two things. First off, which one's the proton, which one's the electron. Give me the values of the accelerations and tell me is it moving away or towards the charged object. Okay, so on 17, I want to see which one you're talking about. I want the value of the acceleration and then I want if it's moving towards the weight. And both of your accelerations should be something times 10 to the teens. Now, the beauty of it is that's your accelerations, okay? So you couldn't accelerate like that for very long because you'd be going faster than the speed of light. So that's that acceleration, but that doesn't, like, wow, that's a really big acceleration. Yeah, but it won't accelerate that long, accelerate like that for very long. Okay, on the extra problem, the extra problem. Because uh, if A is wrong, kind of everything else is going to be wrong. So A should be like 0 0.06 ish. Okay, that's a huge ish, but something around 0 0.06. And then on B, you've got to go old school, calculate the old school gravitational force and compare that. <coughs> So uh, that answer on B should be something times 10 to the 10th, okay? So let's talk about the historical perspective on that answer. So if you look at where science was after Ernest Rutherford did his results, okay? So remember, Ernest Rutherford took gold foil. This is the one. Okay, they won't let me have gold foil. It's expensive. But he shot alpha particles, okay? which are these tiny, 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 not even an entire helium atom. It was just the nucleus of the helium atom. And even if you look at like the element helium, a long time we didn't know helium existed. We're, the reason that helium is called helium is because it comes from the Greek word helios, meaning sun. So when we first discovered helium was actually when we observed the light spectrum from the sun. And it had an emission spectrum that we'd never seen before. And later on, this is one of the key things how we figured out fusion process was driving the sun, because hydrogen combines to produce helium. So what's happening right now, the mass of the sun is about 75% hydrogen and about 25% helium. But the sun is continuously losing mass because hydrogen is making helium. So that, that percentage is continuously changing. We're continuously losing hydrogen and we're continuously gaining helium. And the mass of the sun is actually decreasing. Now, don't worry about it. It's like, oh, I feel that. That's something that had sense. No, okay, really? How does that start? Like, how did the sun start that process? They had a jump, jumper cables. <laughs> so what happened, this is how it how... <laughs> This is how any, any star process starts. So if you look at what happened after the Big Bang, okay, energy space-time began to spread out. Energy cooled as it spreads out. It's kind of like blowing in your hand with puckered lips. It expands, it cools. As it cools, energy changes into mass. We get more into this equation, E equals MC squared. Okay? So pure energy began to cool down enough where you began to get protons, electrons, okay, that type of thing. So we don't know exactly why, but thankfully there was enough fluctuations in the distribution of mass that you had regions that had slightly more mass than the other regions, and they began to pull in more mass. And this became like a snowball, because as it took in more mass, then the gravitational field got stronger, and then that pulled in more mass, and that made the gravitational field stronger, okay? And so what happened is that you reached a point where you would begin this, where the, the, you reached such incredibly high temperatures and such high pressure that the fusion process started. And so you had to reach a critical temperature and a critical pressure inside the core of that star to start the process.
So what would you would see would be cool. So if you could see at the early stages of our universe, it would be kind of like at night during the summer where you have fireflies and you, and you see like little flashes of light. So that's what you would see in our universe as stars began to form. So you would see flashes of light begin to occur where this fusion process started. But that took about, I don't remember the exact years, like a million years or something before you actually began to see stars form. Because it had to cool down enough, gravity had to kick in. But that's, and so that's what, and I hopefully you all see this in your lifetime. I don't know if I'll see it in my lifetime. But where fusion becomes a viable option for the production of electricity, because the only byproduct out of it is helium which is kind of cool. But the problem is that you have to simulate the conditions inside of the star, mm -hmm. which is incredibly high pressure and incredibly high temperatures because the protons want to go flying apart, so you have to overcome that natural repulsion to keep, those to keep the protons apart. Mm -hmm. So you have to smash them together, let the strong nuclear force take over, and then you get a slight loss of mass, you get energy out of it, boom, you're off to the races. So, okay. Um, Anyway, so your acceleration on C, um, that problem should be around 30 meters per second squared. Okay. What, Vitor? How did, like, how, like, how did the space that we're expanding into, like, that doesn't make sense. Like, where did that come from? <laughs> it, did, it didn't like, exist it's always beforehand. Been here? It did not exist. Space and time did not exist. So it's, it's, the, it's the idea, like, if you could, it's a, it's, it's a great thought experiment. So the Big Bang, which is an oxymoron because there wasn't any sound. But this event occurred, and space and time didn't exist until this began. So if you could, like, it's, it's the question, like, if you could be on the leading edge of the universe, if you could ride that wave, like you're a surfer, and you're riding the wave, what would you see? Well, you couldn't see anything because there is no space or time until that goes out. So there was nothing until space and time expanded out into that. Don't, I'm telling you now, don't think about it too much. You're going to end up in the corner in one of two conditions. In the fetal position, sucking your thumb or doing drugs. <laughs> Those are two options. So let's not go with either one right now. Have we had any successful attempts with hydrogen chloride? Huh? Have we had any successful attempts with fusion? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have. But the problem is the overall energy input is still higher than the energy that we get out. But there's hope. Just use there's that. Hope. We should just use okay, that. any other questions? Going once, going twice. No. So. Oh, actually, we'll... Okay, we'll stop yonder. Do you want that stick along? That simulation called the electric field of hockey. And so it's kind of cool. So what you have is the goal, okay? And the puck or the soccer ball, depending upon your sport, is a positively charged situation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag a positive charge here. Now, the cool thing about this is that it shows you, as you drag it, it keeps track of the magnitude of the force that's going to be exerted on that. And it also shows you the direction of that force. Okay? So if I drag this up here, so as I get it closer, that force becomes bigger. If I drag it further away, the force becomes smaller. So we'll start off with something simple, right? Straight on shot, we hit start. And you even get noise with it. Go! Okay. Now, so let's try difficulty, but you got the idea, right? Okay. So let's try difficulty one. So, there's levels. Oh, oh there's levels. Oh, we're screwed. There's levels. I thought it was just that. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. There's level three. So you'd have to direct it around all of that to get 
in the goal. So let's just start with level one, okay? Let's just start with level one. So what we're going to do is we're going to go around, okay? Keaton, you're going to start, and you're going to tell me what to do with either a positive or negative charge and where you want me to put it. So we need to get that positive charge into that goal around that barrier. I'm assuming the negative is an attraction force? Yes. Okay. So you, so we'll just clear the board, and we're going to start from scratch. Start so Keith, what do you want? Uh, say the positive one below it, a little bit to the left. So below it and down here? Sure, that works. That good? I think. Sure. Yeah, sure. Is there an out of bounds, or does it bounce off the wall? No, 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 hold on. So let's hit start, <laughs> okay? <laughs> And it just goes away. <laughs> it's gone. Okay. So, reset. I feel like I have an idea. What? <laughs> okay, never mind then. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. What? Oh, oh, I have an idea. What do you want to do but, now? You know, whatever. You can tell me all. I can either put a positive or negative charge somewhere. Like, put a negative charge on the other side of the walls? barrier. The other right side to the have, like, more Here? Yeah, sure. So, there? Yeah. So, what's your thought process? Or you could just put that a bunch of negatives hold, uh, inside the wall. Okay? So, basically. So, basically. Build up the amount you use. <laughs> Don't make me go Zach on you. No, I was telling her about my idea that no one wants to hear. What's that? Give it to you, <laughs> no just wait, just wait. No, I don't want to hear it. You just yes, you do. It's a good idea. <laughs> Tell me then. Put a bunch of the, the, the negatives in the goal, right? But also, <laughs> that's like, and then as you go uh, along the walls, you know, you add more of the whatever you're using, because so then the force is greater, and it'll overcome the other one. You know what I mean? I get it. Isn't that a good idea? No. Yes. Yeah, I'm kind of cheating, but okay. How's that cheating? <laughs> okay, I don't know. so ask. <laughs> so let's figure out what we're, this is the hand that we're dealt right now. So that positive force is going to push the puck in this direction, right? So you're thinking then, if this negative charge, you're in effect going to pull it into orbit. Yeah. And then it's going to slingshot around here and go down like this. Okay. Right? Okay, so it's gonna go like parallel and go left of the goal. To the left, it's just it's just like because okay. Wow. That was close. It was close. It was close. See, so look, it would have went right in if it hadn't hit that. So, Aspen, we'll let you tweak yours a little bit. What do you want to do? Can I move the positive? Yeah. Can I move the positive just a little bit, like? Counterclockwise to the puck. Like counterclockwise is it? That's crazy. That's no. Up like there. Yeah. Try that. I like that. Pull it together. Oh, oh. not far enough. You pulled it. You, you oh, pushed sadness. it. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> All right. Jackson. Not the Jeopardy music. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Uh, I think it's that one. Can we put a positive in a place where it was direct, like on the right side for us? Uh, um, so like somewhere over here? Other side. Other side? But low. Here? Lower. 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 Lower? Yeah. Like right there? So then it'll push the puck back into the goal when when we get it to go down. So if we hit start. Oh, yeah. It says that still, but as soon okay. as we get the puck going down <laughs> in the right direction. Yeah, we, we got to get that first. <laughs> right. So let's deal with that, that crisis first. Oh, okay. So where do you want that positive charge to move? What's the goal? We need the assist. Which positive? The goal group. That one that you drug out. Um, we can place it uh, up and to the left. Right? Through the wall, I guess. Uh, yeah. Here? A little bit farther to the right. Right, right. Other way. Yeah. There? Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, I didn't go in. Didn't go in. Oh, we'll give him that though. Oh, no, no, no. So now what can we do? Move it a little bit. Just tweak it. Just pull it up. Pull what? Push the red one up. Push the red one up. Or just add another red one over there. Just a touch. So, Louie, you're emphatic about this one. What do you want to do? Just push it up like. There? No, a little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more? Wait, what if we just put it red right next yeah, to Yeah, why don't we just put it red right, right below the goal? That's Cross. what I said. Cross. Okay, are we good? So you want to try this one? Yeah, sure. Let's try. We should try to do it. It ain't going wire. Oh, it ain't going wire. Oh, 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 oh. So, Sam, what do you want to do? Well, if we, we should have moved the red one back to where it originally was and then just put, like, another red one below the goal almost. Like, a little to the left of the goal, but a little below the goal. Okay, so you want to add a red one where? Like a little right. to the left of the goal and a little below the goal. There? Yeah. So what you're thinking I feel like that's not a good angle. is that's going to be launched here. Yeah. It's going to be pushed away from that red. Yeah, and pulled. It's going to be pulled towards the blue. And it's going to be pushed Which is going to slingshot it around like an orbit. Push it back into that. And then it's going to come down here. This red is going to... Yeah, but it's going to be at a bad angle. I'm not even going to lie. Like, maybe well, well because to if, if we didn't move the previous one, then yeah, I, like, that's I what I messed mean. up. But yeah. then it's not going to work. So, so move, move that previous down. one back down to the right. Move it down. Move the bottom right. What, hold on. Which, which, which previous one? The top one. Top move right, it down a little bit? The top. Down to the right. Yeah. Okay. And move then the, move the bottom right one to the left a little bit. Yeah. Here-ish? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Maybe it was good. Maybe. Try it? Yeah, try it. Sand it. I, oh! <laughs> move, move that bottom one up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, move you, the bottom one up? Yeah. yeah this yeah, one? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Probably to the right. No, that's good. That's good. That's, no, that's good. good. Yeah. V Vitor is giving us the, the, the thumbs up. We'll do Vitor's we'll if this fails. Okay. Oh. All right. We're killing Vitor's this fails. Oh, okay. A little bit farther. Everybody jump. Keep going. Keep moving it up. Go farther. Or or move the top one up. Nah, that's good. Don't mess with the top one. Don't mess with the top one. Don't mess with the bottom one. Yeah. Okay. Now we, we, got, we got level three in the back. How long, right how long did it take <laughs> to get this? Now, let me show you the most impressive one I ever did. He got it down on the screen. No, I actually, we actually Come saved on, this. Get the camera. Okay. He just did it in one. It was probably just one. I can't believe I just hit that. I can't believe I just hit that. That was actually so hard to do. Oh. Three tries. I'll actually be so surprised. Super honest. Like that. Guys, I just beat my mom at a basketball game. It sounds like a Vitor's really Everybody sucks. Like, oh, so yeah. 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 You didn't get a clip. It is. Yes, you clipped it. Clip it. Clip it. How long ago was this? That's a clip. Seven years ago? Four or five years ago. What did you say? Clip it. That's a clip. I clipped my mom at a clip. You have a sister? Do like a 360 double. Interesting. What's your last name? I'm gonna make like a drawing. What? This might have been her. Oh, one I don't know that. Anyone else? <laughs> oh come on. That's awesome. So you make the first. She did it. You know the party goal. Yep. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Is that the same? Okay. Whoa. No, it's the camera. But this is, but this is a completely different system. So this is like the medium version of this. So we, we, had, been, we had been doing this for like, I thought probably like about half an hour. So now you've got two different ones here. So you've got, we're starting here. You've got a collection of negatively charged ones here. And then some positive charges up there. And then we've got some random ones around the back. Okay. So this, this, this literally probably took me like it's a half an hour to do. So, ready? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. What? Oh, what? <laughs> it goes completely off the screen. most impressive one it literally went completely off the screen and then came back wow. so anyway so if you if you google uh field fat simulation field of hockey 
then uh, that comes up and there you go. Okay, so. Is that on YouTube? No, it's, no, no, you should just post Google. it, it'll go viral. Yeah, no. <laughs> Come on. Open. I actually got hit twice because they broke like the one half yeah. and then they broke but the other I don't half. Either. Yes, I do. I have to count Andrew's right now. The first one wasn't already. bad. He hit it pretty hard. You want to go tomorrow? I, no, I have another one. Boy, why? Can we do it? No, uh, I'm out of center blocks. Why, why do you have to go? <laughs> oh, that's you more. The doctor. <laughs> on a Friday? So are we not hanging out tomorrow? Four. No, it's at four. Just at four. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, but not after school. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's do that. Because I'm going to have to get, I'm gonna have to get Arden to get her haircut anyway. Do we watch shooting water? So I don't want to talk about there twice, bullets? you know? Huh? Do we watch shooting water bottles with exploding sodium bullets? Question? No. Yeah. 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 Or should we go tonight? Mm -hmm. Where are we going tonight? Go tonight? Are we going to Aldi's? No. Oh, oh, we go to Aldi's and we go to Bank Shaw. That's right next to it. My bad. Hold on. This thing is going really, really slow. It's actually Aldi. There's no S. Yeah. But. Right? <laughs> so there's no S in Aldi. I hate this laptop. No, it's Aldi's. Like, like, apostrophe. Yeah, it's no. Aldi. But what's it Aldi? Do you actually think it's Aldi's? Like, what's it possessing? <laughs> yeah, it's Aldi's. It's not Aldi. Aldi. If it's, it's a Aldi. pot, like if... No, it's what? not, because Aldi's a person. No. It's, yeah. oh, what it says on the billing is Aldi. Ah, that's a man. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh? So are you. Yeah. Dylan, what's that doesn't mm. have an apostrophe, does it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. But it's not on the list. I don't think so. It just says well, Aldi, uh, yeah, look look it up, Burkham. Okay. What? <laughs> if it's Aldi or Aldi's. It's Aldi. Aldi's <laughs> 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 oh, oh, the nuts. I always thought it was Aldi's. You like what? It's I always thought it was Aldi's. Aldi's. I think it's Aldi. It's Aldi. It's Aldi. There's, no, there's no S in like, the name. Like, it's, it's weird. I'm going We're not arguing. This is fat. Like, like, We're not going to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's like McDonald's. You're not going to McDonald's. But it's in there's the There's no S in the name. It's like it's not Kroger's. Yeah. We don't go to yeah, Kroger. That, what Kroger do we have? Dylan. Yes, you go to Kroger. I gotta go. Yeah, Kroger is Dylan's. It's yeah. the same thing. You're going to say I'm going to Kroger. Yeah, they yeah, do. Yeah, well, if, if it was called Kroger, you would say that. It's Kroger stores and people say, you gotta go to Kroger. Not Kroger's. Oh, it's Kroger. Kroger. It's Aldi, Kroger, Costco. I love Costco. Okay. Costco is my Costco's favorite Sam's, store. Sam's, Sam's, it's Sam's too. Costco and Sam's. Huh? It's not Costco. Costco. No, it's not. Are you going to Costco's? It's Costco's. Oh, you know it. It's Costco's. It's not even a name. Costco? 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 Which one did you want to see? Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's tell you one. All these are. I just care. Last week we made and shot the world's first liquid metal filled bullets. We shot it into a fish tank and compared it to a normal lead bullet. And you can see that the soft sodium bullet expanded much more violently and rapidly than a lead bullet. So today we're going to try more tests by shooting them at watermelons, cans of starting fluid, and other things that explode. Let's get started. I would like to have this shot. First up is the watermelon test. It's not exactly a scientific approach, but it's a pretty common benchmark used by other YouTube channels. Now it's the sodium bullet. <laughs> that bullet had some punch. I'd say it was a pretty good reaction. An interesting thing about sodium is that it's reactive with water, but not so reactive, so you'll find little bits of it laying around afterwards. What? Oh. On your other computer, maybe? Now we're doing potassium, the second most reactive metal we have. I think it's your other computer. Now that was pretty amazing. I just glanced the watermelon at the very tip, and it was still enough to just completely 
shatter it from the top down and blow it all across the picnic table. Now for the big one. Now it's time for the sodium potassium alloy bullet. Let's see what it does for watermelon. Let's do it. It is super effective, and a cool side effect is these bullets are so reactive with the air that they instantly catch on fire as soon as they leave the gun barrel, making for a pretty impressive homemade tracer thing. And yeah, it vaporized that watermelon. It's so moist. Uh, okay. There's no way he just said that. All right. So in. I don't like people that would don't like the word moist. They <laughs> understand like the people that don't like the word moist. There are certain moist. classic experiments that you need to know. So one of them is known as the milk and oil drop experiment. Now, admittedly, this is not the most exciting video in the entire world. But in terms of significance, it is. Because one of the things they struggled with is that how do you find the charge on a single electron? Okay, number one, even if you could isolate the mass, okay, how can you find the mass of one single electron? Let alone, oh, how do we get 1.6 times the negative 19? So what this does is that it goes through and chronicles the importance of this work. So this just falls under the general, hey, broad knowledge of science category of things that you need. So Dominican. Dominican. Major funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB project. century. Of course, it eventually became the modern television tube. But before that misfortune, it actually served a useful purpose that I'd like to tell you about. Here's a particularly simple cathode ray tube. It consists of an evacuated glass tube with two electrodes inside. I'm going to apply 20,000 volts across those two electrodes, but first I have to turn out the lights so you can see what happens. Okay. Now you see what happens is that it glows inside, and also, this Maltese cross casts a shadow on the end. The Maltese cross is the positive electrode. I'd like you to know something else about it too. I can easily move around the shadow just by bringing up a simple bar magnet like that. Okay? Right from the beginning, people suspected that that glow was actually a beam of charged particles because it was so easily deflected with an ordinary magnet. But to prove that that was true, you would have to deflect it also with an electric field, and for some strange reason, that didn't work. Then along came a British physicist named J.J. Thompson.
Thompson was a brilliant experimental physicist, but strangely enough, he was very clumsy. In fact, the legend is, he broke every cathode ray tube he ever touched. <laughs> this is a replica of one of Thompson's tubes, and like one of his own, it's also broken. <laughs> Thompson realized that the reason the electric field didn't work was because the vacuum in the tube wasn't good enough. And he also figured out that the reason the vacuum wasn't good was because of gas that was stuck on the walls of the tube when the glass blower sealed it off. And he figured he could solve that problem by heating the tube as it was being sealed off. And so he had the tubes placed in an oven to be heated while the glass blower was sealing it. And that trick worked. After he did that, the electric field deflected the beam. And so Thompson was able to show that the beam was made of electrically charged particles. And he quickly showed that the same charged particles came from every kind of matter. What Thompson had done was the first splitting of the atom. He had shown that the ultimate indivisible particle of matter really had internal parts after all. The honor of naming the new particle should have gone to its discoverer, J.J. Thompson. And he wanted to call it the corpuscle. But that name didn't stick because it really had already been named. It was called the electron. And so J.J. Thompson split the atom and discovered the electron by baking his tubes. <laughs> this name, the electron, started a tradition in physics of naming things with individual units with names that end in ONS. So that, for example, the individual unit of light is called a photon, the unit of sound is called a phonon, the unit of matter is a proton, and we have neutrons, and so on. In fact, recently sociologists have discovered that even human populations have individual units called persons. <laughs> Once the atom had been split and the electron had been discovered, the crucial job that remained was to measure the electric charge of the electron. And that job was done in one of the classic experiments in all of physics by the great American experimentalist Robert Andrews Millikan. A small beaker of oil, a sturdy iron pot, just enough power. A dash of discipline, a measure of creativity, and perhaps a touch of genius. These were the essential ingredients in the physicist's very experimental recipe. The scientist, Robert A. Milligan. The achievement, measuring the value of the charge of the electron. The preparation time, almost half a century. 1868, the year a young nation still shaky from the Civil War was linked together by the Transcontinental Railroad. That same year, Robert A. Milliken was born, the son of an Iowa preacher. He set out across the plains for Ohio to study the classics at Oberlin College. Later, because there wasn't an opening to teach Latin or the history of ancient Greece, he became an instructor of elementary physics there. He showed promise. Columbia University awarded him a fellowship in physics, which he lost after the first year. The loss of support made him doubt, but not give up on his ability as a scientist. He went back to the Midwest, where he studied under Albert A. Michelson at the University of Chicago. Michelson had been awarded the Nobel Prize for developing an extraordinary instrument to measure distances by the interference of light waves. Milliken wanted more than a summer session at Chicago. He wanted to launch his career in physics there. To prepare himself further, 
He visited a number of legendary universities and laboratories of the old world. Before North America achieved prominence, Europe was the continent that most inspired scientific discoveries. Before the First World War, Millikan's inspiration was molded not only by the long shadows of Newton and Galileo, Kepler and Copernicus, but by the fact that he himself could walk among the living giants of his own day. The Englishman William Ramsey, who discovered helium, neon, xenon, and krypton. Wilhelm Röntgen, German discoverer of the X-ray. Guglielmo Marconi and Karl Braun, who developed the wireless telegraph. Like Leibniz and Newton in calculus, they made their discovery at the same time, but certainly not together. Albert Einstein, Max Planck, and Johannes Stark were hard at work in Germany. But the greatest direct influences on Millikan seem to have been British. J.J. Thompson and his student H.A. Wilson at the Cavendish Laboratories. The Electron. X-rays and radiation. Such discoveries made physics an exciting frontier, and he was eager to cross its threshold. Yet Milligan was nothing if not careful in his work. And it would take a decade before he began to make his mark in the world of science. He was already in his 40s, and had only just become an associate professor at the University of Chicago. But about the same time Marie Curie was awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry, she'd already received one in physics, he began to measure the charge of an electron. His groundwork had been laid by Thompson, a Nobel laureate in 1906 for his investigations on how gases conduct electricity. This brilliant Englishman had discovered the electron and developed the cloud method to measure its charge. This chamber was invented to study atmospheric clouds. But in the hands of Thompson and his colleague, H.A. Wilson, it had gone above and beyond its original purpose. A sudden expansion of air, saturated with water vapor, forms clouds. If there are dust particles on which to condense, that supersaturated vapor would also condense on ions. Electrically charged particles created by an X-ray tube. Each drop of water would have the electric charge of a single electron. With this insight, Thompson and Wilson set out to determine the average charge on an average droplet. The cloud chamber method was difficult. The experiments, which involved measuring the rate of fall of the cloud in an electric field, were subject to countless uncertainties. Nonetheless, they finally obtained an estimate of the electron charge. Only an estimate. But it was correct in its order of magnitude. To a man like Robert A. Milliken, it was an open door to his particular talent. Precise measurements of the most fundamental physical quantities. Milliken repeated Wilson's experiments at the University of Chicago. To ionize the gaseous cloud in the chamber, he used x-rays at first, and then small amounts of radium. He tried a more powerful electric field in the chamber. If this worked, it would be powerful enough to balance the force of gravity and to keep the cloud suspended without motion. Now all this looked pretty good on paper, but when things got moving, there was a little problem. With such powerful electric forces in the chamber, the water vapor cloud quickly disappeared. But Millikan turned this problem into an advantage. When the electrical field was turned on, individual droplets stayed in view. Millikan imagined measuring single water droplets rather than an entire cloud. If it were possible to make measurements on the droplets, the effects of individual electrons could be detected. A brilliant insight, but not without a problem. Water evaporates. Instead of water, Milliken wondered, 
Why not use droplets of oil? Oil, unlike water, doesn't evaporate. In 1907, at the University of Chicago, it began to fall into place. Given the apparatus to produce a mist of oil, Millikan was increasingly confident that the electrical charge of an electron could be accurately measured. Under his guidance, Harvey Fletcher, a graduate student from Brigham Young University, suggested an atomizer. Fletcher's first apparatus for the oil drop experiment. Like Millikan's original idea, was simple, powerful, and altogether brilliant. It was a combination that began to work. The essence of the experiment is to apply an electric field to an electrically charged drop of oil falling through the air and then to analyze the result using Newton's powerful equation F equals MA. So that's the mass of the drop times the acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces acting on it. What forces act on a falling drop of oil? There's the force of gravity, of course. And then there's the effect of viscosity. An oil drop if only for a millionth of a second, has the acceleration of a free-falling body. But after that first millionth of a second, the oil drop reaches terminal velocity. Like any sphere falling through a viscous fluid, it falls at constant speed. The viscous force on a moving sphere, worked out by the English physicist George Stokes in the 19th century, is equal to 6 pi times the radius of the sphere times the viscosity of the air, times the speed of the sphere. Very quickly, the speed grows until the viscous force is big enough to balance gravity. That's the only very Instead of accelerating, the sphere falls at constant speed. Millikan had to measure this speed in order to find out how big each drop was. Even with a powerful telescope, an individual drop was too small to see. What Millikan saw looked like a star in the night sky, a pinpoint of light that couldn't be resolved into its spherical shape. But by watching his star drift slowly from one scratch mark to another on his telescope, and using the known density of the oil, he could measure its precise size. the electric field and create an electric force equal to the electric field strength times the charge on the drop. That's the charge Millikan was really after. Due to one electron, or at most a small number of them, it would be an integer multiple of the fundamental unit of electric charge. With the electric force, he could drive the drop upward until, once again, it reached a constant speed. So basically, Together with the speed he measured with the field off, the new speed gave him everything he needed to find the charge. The experiment was designed with the most exquisite care, a hallmark of Millikan's work. To minimize turbulence on the oil drops as they drifted between parallel plates, a heavy iron pot was designed to house and protect the plates. Air would be filtered through glass wool before entering an atomizer designed to spray the finest mist of oil droplets into the chamber. Even the light to illuminate the droplets was filtered. A solution of copper sulfate and a mute tube of water would remove the light's excess heat. When the time came, 
Millikan saw to it that nothing would disturb his experiment. Stopwatch in hand, hour after hour he would peer through his telescope, through the portal and into the chamber. Deep within the heart of the chamber, he would see a single charged droplet of oil glowing like a star. Under the influences of gravity and viscosity, the droplet would fall. Down through inner space, the star would fall until it would reach the top scratch mark and Milliken would start his stopwatch. It would keep falling until it would reach the bottom mark. Milliken would enter the time it took each drop to fall. Then he'd turn on the electric field, turning the oil droplet into a rising star. At the bottom mark, he'd start the watch, letting it run until the rising drop would cross the finish line on top. Again and again, he'd record how long it took to rise and fall, often observing a single droplet hours on end. Hundreds of measurements were taken, recorded, mused over, and eventually analyzed to give the most accurate measurement ever made of the fundamental unit of electric charge. Milliken's final published measurement, 4.77 times 10 to the minus 10 electrostatic units, was only 2% different from his result prior to using oil in the experiment. Robert A. Milliken's fort was precision, an ability to detect and eliminate error, and with extraordinary diligence and creativity to improve on existing tools. In public statements, and there were many as he became an elder statesman of the academic community, he used every opportunity to extol the scientific method. The scientist's responsibility was to make measurements without bias and to let nature dictate the answers. The scientist's job was to make each measurement, no matter how painstakingly, and to publish everything. Determining the significance of the data, that was the job of the scientist's peers. Milliken's peers understood the significance of this work. In 1923, he became the first native born American to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Milliken went on to head the California Institute of Technology, an American institution, and to become one himself. His name became and remains synonymous with scientific progress. In the first half of the 20th century, his image, next to Albert Einstein's, was that of the most famous physicist in North America. I'd also like to show you what the experiment itself looked like. There's one thing I particularly want you to notice. It's this canister right over here. If it looks familiar to you, it's because the same one is right there at the end of the bench. That's Millikan's own oil drop experiment, still functioning after all these years. Now I have something truly extraordinary I would like to show you. When Millikan did his experiment, he gathered together his results, and he wrote them up to be published in a scientific journal for all the world to see. But before that, while he was all alone in his laboratory, he had to have a place to write down the results of his experiment as he was doing it. That place was his laboratory notebook. It was never intended for anyone else to see. It was for Millikan's eyes only. Notes in that book. So this is before spreadsheets. This page is dated Wednesday, December 20th, 1911. Here, Millikan writes down the temperature and the pressure in the room. And here, under the letter G for gravity, a series of figures, each one of which is the time it took his oil drop to fall between the two scratch marks on his telescopes. Then, a similar column under F for field the electric field, and again, the time the takes the oil drop to fall. From those times, he calculates velocities. 
v1, v2, and so on. Using those velocities, he finds the logarithm of v1 plus v2, so he can add it to one half the logarithm of v1. And finally, here, Millikan reaches his result. And then he writes, this is almost exactly right. But how can he say that? 